Okay, yeah, thanks, Simon. Yeah, so as Simon said, this the idea for this talk came to me yesterday when we were looking at the CSV um, thing. So my normal pattern of loading CSVs is like this as well. I use pandas and then I use pd read CSV and then I can use like 2SQL or 2HDF5 or something to like put, put it into something else. But um, there's this little project called Odo that's spun out of Blaze and that actually really um, automates a lot of this for you. And all you need to do is say, from Odo, import Odo, and then you can tell it its source data set and a target data set, and it just magically moves your data from the one into the other. So here we've got an um, archive sample CSV file, and then I put it into a SQLite database, because that's kind of what I had on my, um, um, my laptop. But it uses SQL Alchemy, so anything that SQL Alchemy understands, it can put the data into. And it's also smart about chunking and like um, processing large data sets. It also understands regular expressions, so you don't. You can put it here: git type archive underscore star dot csv, and then it will know that it's a whole bunch of csvs, and it will go through each of them and put them into wherever you want it to go into. Um, the yeah, so it's like let's say you have um, gzipped csv files, and you want to create um, a file with uh, a JSON blob on every line. You just need to put a little um, UI classify in the front, and it will pump it out for you. I mean, I could show you um, I have the data on open. Well, if I have time, I can show you some of the files. But yeah, it kind of works as advertised. It also gives you a little um, method called discover. So if you want to just peek inside a data set and see what the D types are, if it knows how to read it, it will come back and tell you like these are what it understood the types to be. Um, I mean, so far this maybe isn't that much more. Um, yeah, this is another example. Here I've got a, the Chinook sample database. It's a replacement for Northwind. Here's the schema diagram. Um, I looked inside what has happened as one table, the artist table, which is the top left table here. And then again, I just took it out and put it in a CSV file. One liners and like works. Um, so, what's the point? I mean, that, that you can just do with for loops. But the, the nice thing about Odo is that it um, knows how to convert all the things. So here's a diagram of all the file types that it understands. And if you give it a source file and a, a target data type, it will find, using network X, it will find the shortest path on that graph to like transform your data from your source into your, your target. And then also the, the red nodes are special, because I think those all can handle um, out of core data operations. So if you have, I don't know, 10 terabytes of data that won't fit in your laptop, it will, um, if you start with a red node and you end with a red node, it knows that um, it wants to do it out of core, so it will only process small chunks at a time that sit in memory and um, go to the target. So it's yeah, very cool. Use it. Um, I think it's yeah, very cool. Um, just some caveats. Uh, I did pick some of my examples a bit judici judiciously. So sometimes I found it doesn't quite work with that GitHub archive, actually, because it's nested dicts. Couldn't put it into a CSV nicely because of the nesting. Um, it's made by the guys at Continuum, and they're generally pretty smart. So there probably is a way to tell it. I just haven't figured out yet um, how to. But even if it is broken, I think the, the aim of the project is so cool that like rather than not using it, use it and just submit the patch to the GitHub repository and fix it and make it work for everyone. So yeah, please go out and use Odo. Okay. <laughs> Next, we have um, Adriana, who's going to be speaking to us about um, SH. Let's Hello? add Hello? one thing to the. Okay. Yeah, just one second. Cool. Um, yeah, something I forgot to say. There is a. It's also very easy to extend um, Odo. So they've provided an API for how to register your own data type. So if you're working with sh f um, files in the medical 
imaging industry that has like some strange binary format. You can just write your converter to one of the types that it understands and, and register that with Odo and then you connect to the graph and then you can pump that into whatever output format that you want. So yeah, it's a benefit. Cool. So are you going to say something? Start. Okay. So if you, like me, you love Bash and you love Python, you may have at some point thought to yourself, if only someone made a library that let me write shell scripts in Python where the syntax is as beautiful and intuitive and simple and terse above all else as it is in Bash. Well, someone just did that. Um, SH is a library which is essentially provides a, a, a subprocess interface which lets you execute any program as if it were a function. And these functions magically appear in the SH namespace. Uh, anything that is um, on your path is usable. Uh, and I can't type. So you can do that, and it launches no mind if you really want to. Um, so you can do things like this. Uh, you can do things like this. Uh, parameters are parameters, as you would expect. Um, the cool thing is that piping is done by function composition, so you can do this. There we go. Um, <laughs> do this. Um, oh, right. Um, if you have a command that is subcommands like uh, the hg or git, you can do this. They are exposed as functions on the top level thing. You can do this. Um, so if if you just Google for Python library sh, you will get this lovely documentation on Reaper Docs, which is currently obscured. There we go. And you should read the whole thing because you can do all kinds of cool things like baking in default parameters and like more complicated things with standard in, standard out, and all kinds of other stuff. So if you are sick of verbose and unpleasant shell scripts in Python, I suggest you check this out. Disclaimer, I've never actually used this. It just looks really nice. So <laughs> there you go, the end. Um, quickly, while Neil is setting up, uh, those of you who were very observant during the panel discussion will have noticed that there were a few BBD flash drives which um, weren't given away. My plan is to give those away to the first people I see at the sprint tomorrow whose names I don't know. <laughs> 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 so if you come up to me and say, what is my name, and I can't answer. Um, <laughs> Yes. Um, so get Simon very, very drunk. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you ready, Neil? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Neil's going to be talking uh, about Pygame Zero. Okay. So if you've ever written anything in Pygame, you'll have done a something like this. This is all boilerplate code. And if I run that, it does nothing. But that all that code is necessary just to do that. That kind of sucks if you're teaching. Boiling plate sucks. It's hard to write. It's hard to explain. So Pygame Zero is intended to remove boilerplate. Voila. Except unlike my code, it doesn't use escape. It uses control key, Q, to exit the code, which I always forget. And you can do more complicated things. So uh, so we have some images, which I've stolen from one of our other Pygame game games, because I'm not an artist, um, but other people are. I specify width and height. I have a thing which loads an image. I give it a position. Draw gets called every frame and draws. Update gets called every frame and updates. Uh, uh, 
renamed all the directories last night because it seemed like a good idea. more stuff. I now add a couple of states to it. Um, you'll see I've changed the update function to have a DT. Pi game zero knows now that I want the actual delta time, which is great if you're doing physics. I'm horribly abusing it to do an animation. Um, I want to interact, so I have it on mouse down. So that just does what it does. Schedule unique says I want to run this, and unique just means that it will only run once, so if I reschedule it, it will cancel the previous one and reschedule it again. So it flips between two states, and if I actually manage to press on it, it um, changes the animation. So it does that, to there, and it dies. And none of that code was boilerplate. It's really cool. As you will see in a moment, um, Adam's talk may be a little bit controversial. <laughs> yes, courting controversy. Uh, do you have a microphone? Uh, there's a microphone here. It's actually picking up my shouting. Loud voice. Um, you can use the handheld if you like. Oh. Yeah, that'll probably work better. Um, yeah. So I don't want to give the surprise away. Oh, that's assuming that, that KDE actually let me display on the screen. Oh, there we go. Just after I did the system settings, how very, very useful. Damn it. KDE, there we go. What on earth? Right, it's obviously decided. Sure. Of course, now I have to look at the display, unlike everyone else. Very useful, KDE. So, um, we're at a Python conference, but as I'm sure you know, a lot of us use Python for web development. And if you're working in the web space, that means you're working with JavaScript at some point or other, unless you're one of those really lucky people who does back-end only work. Um, this little talk is about how to not hate JavaScript and actually you know, enjoy working with the language. Um, so, the good news is, a little bit earlier this year, ECMAScript 6, which is the newest version of JavaScript, was officially accepted as a, whatever, standard something. Given that the last version came out in 2008, a bit of a long road. Good news is, they're looking to make things a lot quicker. The next version is due to be um, ratified next year. So, they're looking, it looks like they're moving to some kind of yearly language release model. Really cool. The reason why ES6 is exciting is because it's bringing a lot of features which you probably know from Python to JavaScript. Uh, iterators, generators, template strings, destructuring, really cool. Rest and spread operators, you'll probably know that as, as like keyword args and unpacking keyword args, that kind of thing. Promises, um, those are really useful for asynchronous. You probably know them as futures. Fat arrows, think lambdas that inherit their scope from the enclosing scope, really useful for callbacks. A class system, it's actually still built on top of the prototype system, but whereas previously if you were using JavaScript and you wanted classes, you'd have to you know, build your own, they've done it for you. And a module system which works reliably. Um, there's, there's some implementation details to that one, but you don't have to worry about them. So I know you're saying, why do I care? Why do I care? I mean, my, guy, my users are running IE9. They can't use this stuff. This is not going to be available for another five years. Ah, not true. So you can transpile, transpile ES6 code into ES5.1 browsers using a tool called Babel. There are a couple other ones around, Tracure, a bunch of them. But the long story short is the whole idea with, with the new versions of JavaScript is that they, they need to be implementable in terms of being transpilable to older versions of JavaScript within certain limits, the limit being 5.1. What that means is that you can use all these new features in browsers which people are actually using today, not just you know the latest dev builds of Chromium or whatever. And it allows you to write JavaScript code which doesn't make eyes bleed, which is very important in my opinion. So uh, it's, a, it's actually quite a deep topic to go into, so I'm just gonna leave you with some basic links. Babel, 
this is the tool I'd recommend for, for converting your ES6 code to ES5.1. Reasons being, one of their focuses is when transpiling is that the JavaScript that gets produced is stuff that you can actually read and understand. It's not, you know, very weird looking and unpleasant to debug. Exploring ES6, it's a great online book available for free which covers all the new stuff and if you're really lazy, you just have to read it chapters four and five. They cover like, you know, all the cool features and really quickly. Chapter five is obviously a bit of info on how to get up and running. And Webpack, um, there are a lot of ways, because of, because of the whole transpiling thing, there are a lot of ways you can run ES6 code in a modern browser. Uh, they vary between being compiled, uh, you know, compile time kind of stuff, like running Babel on your, on your ES6 files, convert them to ES5 files, doing it in a watch fashion. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff. After a bit of investigation, I think Webpack is the best way because it covers a lot of usage scenarios that people have anyway which includes bundling your files, minifying your files, all that kind of stuff, packing up um, your CSS. It does all of that, and it does this as well, and it uses Babel to do it. Um, that's about it. Uh, if anyone has any hate, just send it to my email address, adam at springlab.co. <laughs> Hello? Hello. Okay. While Jeremy's setting up, um, at the start of the kind of brief closing um, ceremony, I guess, for want of a better word, <laughs> um, if anyone is going to knows that they're going to be sprinting on a particular topic at on the weekend um, and would like to let other people know, um, we'll have a brief opportunity for people just to walk up, grab the microphone, say a few words about what they're going to work on. Um, <laughs> well, while Jeremy's uh, sorting out this place, um, hands up if you've found a bug in the speaker's slides over the last two days. Okay, I meant code bugs. <laughs> we already have. Um, yeah, I think it does. <laughs> okay. Cool. So, Jimmy. Uh, so I can't get uh, display mirroring to work in 30 seconds. So I am very embarrassed about incorrect code on my slides, almost as embarrassed as I am about incorrect codes in production. And the one requirement I have for a presentation tool is that I can unit test my slides. Um, so I'm using Reveal JS. Uh, we all love JS, don't we? And um, Reveal.js, unfortunately, doesn't let you unit test your slides out the box. But there are two things that you can use to make that possible. The first thing is this thing called um, Grunt preprocess. And that's a very simple preprocessor thing that lets you um, do stuff like that. That include code slash part one slash naive PQ, which if you've seen my slides, you know what that code is. Um, and the preprocess task um, collects all your uh, bits of, in my case, markdown, glues them all together into one big generated file, and then reveal JS just thinks that you've given it what it wants. Um, it doesn't know. The other thing is a task called grunt exec, and you configure that to run PyTest on your code directory. And then every time you edit your uh, code, the grunt task that you've got watching things will run your tests, spit out big errors if you've written a bug or written code that isn't uh, PEP8 compliant. And eventually, once you've got everything right, it'll build your slides for you. Next up, we have Richard. Um, Richard is going to be speaking to us about Kiwi. Um, hands up if you know what Kiwi is. Okay, for the yes, end of lightning talk.